All right, um, I'm gonna fill out a few of these for you. Basically, I'm starting with the Lewis structure and sort of taking it through all the information you can get from the Lewis structure. Um, we have learned how to do Lewis structures, but again, I'm gonna do a couple with you. Um, we do have some references here that you need. You need a periodic table, and if you have not memorized the um, like molecular geometry Vesper chart that's in your book, um, then you're going to need to have that in front of you too. You're going to need to be able to reference it. All right, so I'm going to start with the Lewis structure. So number one, I'm going to actually draw it over here off to the side just so that I have some um, some uh, some space to sort of work because again, it gets messy and then you can you know draw it. Um, for real once you've figured out how it goes. I think I'm going to do the oxygens in a different um, color so that we can kind of see um, very specifically what's happening. So I'm just going to pick three different colors. Oxygen is in um, group 16 and so is selenium. So that's why uh, I'm giving six valence electrons to every atom is because they're all in group um, 16. So they all have six valence electrons. Okay, so here, automatically, selenium, our central atom, has two bonding electrons. So right away, I can make two bonds fairly easily. Um, then I need to figure out what do I do with this third, this green oxygen. So that's going to bond to the selenium as well. And you're going to break up one of the lone pairs. So when you break up the lone pair, that, ele that other electron that got broken is actually going to move out here and join the oxygen and create a lone pair. So I have three single bonds and I still have two, um, two, let's see, I have one electron on my red one and one electron on my yellow one that still have not bonded. My green is good to go. One of the electrons bonded and then the extra electron from the lone pair went out and joined my oxygen electron that needed a lone pair. So then, you guessed it, we're gonna make a double bond. So I'm gonna again split this lone pair and connect it to the red, and then what's gonna to happen to that other electron? That other electron is gonna travel down here and join my oxygen um, to create another lone pair. So I actually have a double bond and two single bonds to my oxygen. So I'm going to go ahead and draw that in to my um, diagram. So I have selenium and I have a double bonded oxygen. And then I have two single bonded oxygen. Okay. So the next, um, the next uh, column there asks me number of bonds and number of lone pairs. So when it asks that, it's only speaking about the central atom. So there's no lone pairs on my central atom, right? Zero lone pairs. And then what about the number of bonds? Well, I have a single bond, two single bonds, and one double bond. So that's three bonds. There are two different types, right? A double bond is, is one type, and then single bonds are another type. But I have three total bonds. I have a single bond here, a single bond here, and a double bond there. So I have three bonds. So watch the um, hybridization notes for more details about how to do hybridization. But because there are three um, things total coming off my central atom, right? Three bonds, zero lone pairs. That's three things total. That's SPP, or we actually write that as SP squared is my hybridization. And then my geometry. Again, I can come down here. This is why I said have the reference out um, with three bonds and no lone pairs. That is right here, three bonds and no lone pairs. Because I don't have any lone pairs, um, my geometry and my shape are actually gonna be the same. They're both trigonal planar. Um, the only time the shape and the geometry are different is when we start adding in lone pairs. So there's a both trigonal planar. The wedge and dash diagram is just a 3D diagram um, trigonal planar is all in the same plane, so we actually don't need to put um, the molecules in wedge and dash in this one because they're all in the same plane. In a wedge and dash, dash diagram, um, typically the wedges are coming forward and the dashes are going backwards, um, but again, it's just sort of drawing it 3D. Um, and then trying to decide if it's polar or nonpolar. 
So in order to do that, you need to look at the electronegativities. Here's selenium and here's oxygen. Oxygen is more electronegative than selenium. So that means that I have a more electronegative charge going these, this direction. So if I were gonna put partial charges on all of this, right, this would be partially negative, partially negative, partially negative, with this partially positive in the middle, um, because there's no way to split that up, right? I can't, there's no way to be attracted to the positive um, without being repelled by the negative. Um, it is a nonpolar molecule. So um, you could double check the electronegativities of the oxygen and selenium um, to, you know, subtract their electronegativities, decide if it's higher than 0 0.3. If it's higher than 0 0.3, your shape comes into... Um, account and that's when you want to talk about just like I did the shape if you subtracted them if it was like oxygen and oxygen so their electronegativity difference is zero then it is um, nonpolar because the bond is also nonpolar um, but you can have a nonpolar molecule even if you have um, some polar covalent bonds but based on the shape it could become a nonpolar molecule all right, so that's all the information you can get just based off of the Lewis diagram. I'm going to do one more. I'll do number two, and then um, I am going to do an expanded octet one for you guys. All right, so arsenic is right here on the periodic table, group 15, which means it has um, five valence electrons. So I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five. And then hydrogen on the periodic tables in group one, it has one valence electron. So I'm going to go ahead and draw single bonds, bonding my one electron to each of my hydrogens. All right, so on my central atom, I have three bonds and I have one lone pair. Again, watch the hybridization notes if you want more explanation on this. But again, four things coming off of my central atom. That's SPPP. We write that as SP cubed. Um, I can come over here to my chart, and I can see this here. So that's three bonds and one lone pair. And this book one is a little hard to read when you're trying to differentiate between geometry and shape. Um, so here, like these two go together, these um, four go together, these are both expanded octet ones. Um, but when I say they go together, I mean the specific molecular geometry is based on like the hybridization, like how many things are coming off the central atom. Because there are four, it the the geometry is a tetrahedral shape. But the actual shape of it, because um, the arsenic doesn't actually have a bond coming off, it's sort of making like this pyramid, right, where we connect all of that was a really bad pyramid, but where we sort of connect all those hydrogen down below, um, like as the bottom of the pyramid and then arsenic sort of the top of the pyramid, um, making like a triangle down below. Um, we actually have what we call a trigonal pyramidal. And then if I was gonna draw a wedge and dash diagram, let's see if I can do this better. Okay, so I have arsenic on the top. I have one hydrogen that's gonna go backwards so I'm going to draw like my two coming forward and then my one going backwards and then those are all of my hydrogen. And if you could imagine looking down on it, right, you'd have the arsenic closest to you and then you would have the three hydrogen down below sort of making a triangle. Um, okay, so then I'm going to take a look at electronegativities of my arsenic and my hydrogen. And they're actually really close. Hydrogen is 2.1 and arsenic is 2. Um, you guys can look up the electronegativities, like the individual ones online, or you can look them up in your book in Chapter 5. Um, you can know general electronegativities, but hydrogen is one of those odd ones that once you get down here into, um, into uh, like the metalloids, the metals, the transition metals, even like the lower nonmetals, it's it's sort of harder to tell if you went and specifically looked them up. Um, okay, so you would see again that hydrogen is 2.1 and arsenic is 2.0. And um, 
Because of that, their electronegativity difference is 0.1. So that means all of these bonds are nonpolar bonds, which means we will have like a slight positive charge up here and slight negative charges down here since the hydrogen is the more electronegative one. But we still consider this a nonpolar molecule because they are making nonpolar bonds um, based on the electronegativity. Okay, and the last one I want to do for you guys from this worksheet is one of the expanded octet ones. So I'm going to go ahead and um, do number seven. So I'm going to draw it off to the side again, sort of like I did before. Phosphorus is right here in group 15, so it has five valence electrons. And then fluorine is right here in group 17, so it has seven valence electrons. I'm going to go ahead and strategically place at least my first three. So when I say strategically place, again, I know that I have to bond to those unpaired electrons. So I'm going to go ahead and put my fluorine in a space where I'm going to easily see bonds, right? So here's three that bond fairly easily, connecting those three. I have no bonding electrons left, right? Absolutely full. This could be a molecule that exists. Everybody has a full octet. However, in this compound specifically, I have two more fluorine that have to connect to that phosphorus, to the central atom. So clearly they have to connect to that lone pair up top. Um, it's the only real option here. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw in um, two more fluorine atoms, at least their Lewis structures. And then what we're going to do is break up this lone pair. So this could only happen with um, extremely electronegative ions. So fluorine and chlorine are the two that usually can um, create an expanded octet. So there we go. So P then is making five bonds. It's sort of hard to draw this um, 3D, at least for me. I'm an awful drawer. <laughs> um, but... I'm going to go ahead and transfer this over here, put in my, my uh, bonds and my lone pairs on my fluorine. I have no lone pairs on my central atom. So if you remember from the, um, the heading on the table in the previous page, this is going to be five bonds and zero lone pairs. My hybridization here is going to be sp3d because um, we start bonding with a d orbital when we go into those expanded octets. Um, what was the next one? Um, oh, okay, so the next one was geometry and then shape. Um, so because there were no blown pairs on there, the geometry and the shape are going to be the same. And we can see here five bonds, no lone pairs, is trigonal bipyramidal. So trigonal bipyramidal. And then same thing, trigonal, bipyramidal. Can't spell today. <laughs> Plus you can't really read it anyway. That says trigonal, bipyramidal. Um, what was the next one? Ooh, it was a wedge and dash diagram. Okay. Um, so trigonal, bipyramidal basically means that... Um, let me go here. You can kind of see in the book. So I'm kind of trigonal bipyramidal. It's making a triangle with three of the central atoms, and then it's got one below and one below kind of making like two pyramids. So that's sort of what's happening in this thing. So I have phosphorus here. It means that I'm going to have like one fluorine here, uh, one fluorine here and one fluorine here. Those ones are sort of making the the triangle. Those are all in the same plane. Um, so I guess you could say if this one's in the plane, then this one's sort of going backwards and then this one's sort of coming forward. Again, all in the same plane. And then you have one going up and one going down. That's, I guess, the best wedge and dash diagram I can do. Um, electronegativity difference is, is basically two to four. Um, I think a phosphorus is the same as hydrogen, so 2.1, and then um, fluorine is a four, so that's 1.9. Um, so a polar covalent bond 
Um, remember, 1.7 is the cutoff for polar covalent than to ionic character. However, we can only have ionic character with a metal and a non-metal. So two non-metals here um, make it an extremely polar covalent molecule. Um, so that means that the fluorines are all attracting the electrons significantly harder than the um, phosphorus is. So all of my electrons are being pulled out in all these directions. Because my partial positive in the, is in the middle and it's sort of surrounded by all of these electrons or all of these negative charges, right? There's no way to get um, a negative charge through those fluorine and to that phosphorus, um, at least not strongly because it's got all of this stuff surrounding it that's repelling. Um, so because of that, that's a non-polar molecule. So even though we have polar bonds, it's a non-polar molecule because of uh, its shape. Um, okay, so that's it. I want you guys to try the rest of the worksheet by yourself. Please let me know if you have any questions. I'm sorry this was a very long example video, um, but hopefully um, that helps you out. All right, have a great day.